Welcome to the Jongets Games tutorial for Wendake. In this video, I'll be teaching you the rules to the game as it's being played, and I'll be showing the first three out of the game's seven overall rounds. Now, I do want to say that the reason this video is being made is because it won the monthly poll that is voted on by some of the Patreon supporters of this channel. If you enjoy videos just like this one, and you'd like to directly support the channel so that they keep being made, then please go to patreon.com slash Games. There you'll find a bunch of different perks that you can get for supporting the channel, including watching exclusive opinion vlogs that I make about all of the games that I play, as well as getting early access to videos like this, and potentially even voting for them. Now, the last thing I'd like to ask is that if you enjoy this specific video, that you please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. And on that note, I think it's now time for us to jump into the game. Out here, we have the game fully set up and ready to play for our three different players. Now, before I start, I would like to ask that you please turn on the Klingon subtitles, because I might make mistakes as I'm showing you the game, and those will let me put corrections on the screen where you should be able to see them. I will also put corrections below this video in the top comment. Well, let's start things off with a brief overview of the game. Thematically, this is set in the mid-1700s in the Great Lakes region of the United States, and it focuses on the native village life of multiple different villages. Now, players are going to be harvesting various crops from fields. They will also be gathering from forests, in addition to fishing and trading with canoes, and expanding out onto the map. Now, the game takes place over seven rounds, and within each of those rounds, every player is going to take four actions. One of those actions will dictate the turn order for the next round, and the other three will involve activating these tiles on their board. The first action can go anywhere, and the second action has to go in the same row, column, or diagonal from the first, as long as at the end of placing all three of these, all three of your tokens are in the same row, column, or diagonal. That means we could place there, but with the second placement, we couldn't go there because we would not be able to end with a diagonal, but if we went there, we could then go here and there and end the round this way. Whenever you place one of these tokens down onto a tile, you perform all of the icons on that tile. So, for example, this tile would let us harvest resources, and this one would let us place a canoe, while that one would let us turn our beavers into pelts and get a movement. Now, at the end of each round, you're going to flip over each one of the tiles that you have activated, and this will always reveal a ritual action, which you can then select on a future turn. Now, after you flip these over, you slide all of these down, and then the bottom three are going to be shuffled and placed up at the top, but before you can do that, you can actually upgrade one of these by swapping it with one of these better action tiles up here. Once you do that, you can then shuffle these up, make sure they don't have the ritual side face up, and then put them onto your board to have new action options for you in the future. Now, for the first three rounds of the game, these will be the options, and in the last four rounds of the game, these more powerful upgrade options will come into play. Now, many of these actions will get us victory points, and there's actually four different types of points in the game, each with their own track. We could get ritual points, economic points, mask points, or military points. And it's important to note that at the start of the game, you randomly pair these up. Now, once we complete the game, which happens after seven rounds, we will then score the lower of the points in each of these pairs, and then add those two lower amounts together to have a final score, and the player with the highest amount of points wins. So as you're playing the game, you want to make sure to balance these in such a way to get the most points once the game is over. The final thing I'd like to mention during the overview is the fact that every time you play the game, you can all choose to have a symmetric start, essentially being different versions of the same type of village, or you can flip these over, shuffle them up, and then pass out these asymmetric villages, which give various effects, like giving you extra components and bending various rules as part of the game. Now, today, we're going with the symmetric start, so we're not going to see any of these asymmetries, but as you can see, the game comes with quite a few of them, so you can play this game many times, having different strengths and weaknesses right from the very beginning. Now, I'll describe how all of this works in much more detail while we are playing, and on that note, let's start the game. For today's tutorial, we are going to play as the red player, and we have the first player token, so let's now take the first turn of the game. With that in mind, let's focus over here on our player board. As you can see at the start of the game, we have a leather, a fish, as well as one corn, and these two beavers over here that we've caught. And on our turn, we have to select one of these action pawns, and we can either place it onto one of these tiles, or we can place it on the turn order track, and I'll talk about that turn order track more later. For the first action of the round, I think we are going to place this right over here. Now, as soon as you place an action token down onto a tile, you perform everything on that tile, starting from the top, and you go down. This one just has a canoe icon, which means we are going to take one of our canoes from the side of our board and place it onto any lake on the main board. As you can see, we all start with one canoe out here, and there are several lakes we could put this into. Technically, it does not matter which area we put it into, they're all functionally the same. And I figure we'll go right up here, because that puts them closer to our other pieces that are out here on the map. 
Well, that's finished up all of the actions on this spot, which means our turn is done, and play can now move to the next player in turn order. We all have these turn order tokens. We were the first player, and over here the blue player has the second player token, so that means they can now take their turn. After thinking things through, they've decided to go over here. Now they can perform this action, which is move, and it has a three, which means they can perform three movement actions. With each movement, they can move one of their warriors that's currently out on the board. And as you can see, they have five warriors over here in their home territory. Every player has their own home territory area, which is defined by this thicker wall line right here. And when you move, you simply take a warrior from wherever they are and move it into an adjacent territory. And the adjacent territories are shown by this line right here. Now, the only restriction is you cannot move a warrior into any other player's home territory. But beyond that, you can cross any of these white lines to move into other areas. So that means they can move three times, and they can split this movement up amongst multiple warriors if they want. For their first movement, they are going to take this warrior and cross over into this territory. Now, whenever a warrior enters a new territory, the player has to decide where they want to place this. Specifically within these territories, there are productive regions, which are denoted by the growing fields, as well as forest areas within each region. Within each of the productive areas, there are spots for the hunters as well as for the women who are harvesting those fields. And if you place a warrior down into one of those productive areas, you have to place it lying down onto an available production spot. If there was already any token there, you could not do this. Or you could simply leave the warrior standing up, not in a productive area, and in that case, they are a guard. When they are lying down, they are an outpost, and the difference between this is a guard can actually protect a region. Now that was the first movement for blue, and with their second movement, they are also going to head into this area, and they are going to create an outpost over here by laying face down onto that area. Now at any point during a player's turn, they can transfer an applicable token from their home territory to an outpost if they want. As I mentioned before, in the growing fields, it shows this woman icon, which means you can transfer this outpost for a woman token, or if this outpost was over here in a forest, that shows the hunter icon, which means you could swap it out for the hunter. Now in this case, Blue has decided to put an outpost over here, and now for free, they are going to swap this out, which means they can place this woman token over here from their home territory, and then this outpost will become a warrior once again within their home territory. Now at this point they've used two of their movement, and as you can see they still have a guard over here, which means this guard is effectively guarding over their productive tokens, which could be in either of these areas. Now it is possible to fight and remove opposing pieces in this game, and I'll talk about how that works more later on. Now blue does have one more movement available to them, and they've decided to move this warrior across into there. Now it's important to note that you cannot move a warrior that has already been moved back into your home territory within the same turn, so they cannot move this warrior once again. Now once they enter this area, they're going to lay it face down into that productive region, and then swap that out. So it looks like at the end of the day, they've placed one guard out here, and two of these woman tokens down into the fields where they could harvest vegetables in the future. All right, blue is done with their turn, and the next player in turn order is going to be yellow with this third player token. Just like we've seen before, Yellow has to take one of their pawns and do something with it, but instead of activating one of these tiles, they've decided to go over here and change the turn order. Remember, within each round of the game, one of these must define turn order, and the other three will activate these tiles, so Yellow has decided they would like to head over here. Now, as you can see, there is a turn order track on the board, and when you place your action pawn over here, you place it into the lowest value number. So they can place it right here, and that means they will have the first player token in the next round of the game. That also means yellow is done with her turn, so now we can take our second turn of the round. For the second turn, honestly, I think let's go over here and reserve our turn order. That way we are going to go second in the next round, instead of potentially going third if blue got in there first. So that finishes a quick turn for us which means blue can go, and one of these must be placed over there, but they figure there's no rush to do that, they may as well have that be their last pawn, so instead they're going to place one of these onto an action. Now, when you place a second action pawn down, it must go so that it's in the same row, or column, or diagonal as a previously placed pawn, and it must be placed in a way where at the end of the round, all three of your action pawns are in the same row, column, or diagonal. What that means is they can place this either here, here, or in these two spots. They can't go into this diagonal because of course you can't have a line of three going off in that direction. So functionally they have four different options available to them, and of course by choosing one of these that will dictate what their next action will be. If they go here, then their third action will have to be that. If they go here, then their third action will have to be that, and so on. After considering these options, they are going to place right over here. 
So let's focus on that action a little more. And as you can see, it shows the woman productive icon, an arrow, and then the three different types of vegetables. What this means is they are now going to produce one of the applicable type of vegetable for every productive region they have with at least one of their women tokens. When we look out to the board, we can see they have one of those over here for pumpkin. They have one over here for corn, and they have a bunch of them over here for pumpkin. Each one of the starting regions is associated with different types of vegetables that can be grown, and only in your home territory are you allowed to have multiple of a token on a spot. The fact that they have multiple here does not actually affect this action, though. It's one or more. So they have at least one over here, so that's going to get them a pumpkin, and overall they'll get two pumpkins and one corn. So they can take those from the supply and put them in front of them, and the player board does have some nice icons on it to help with organization. Well, blue is done with their turn, which means it's now time for yellow to go, and they must activate one of the actions in their grid because they have already placed one pawn on the turn order track. After thinking through their options, they've decided to place on their campfire. At the start of the game, this is always in the middle of the grid, and all of these other tiles are randomized. And when you place onto the campfire, you then take your campfire token and place it onto any other one of the tiles that does not have a token already on it, and that will not need to have one of your tokens placed on it by the end of the round. What I mean by that is, let's say, for example, the yellow player had gone here already, and then they went to the campfire. In this case, they could not place the campfire here, because they would be forced to place this token there on their last turn, and there cannot be a campfire and a player token on the same tile. Obviously, this is not the case. Yellow is going here first, so they are now going to place on this spot, and effectively what that means is they are not allowed to place this over here on their next turn, because that would force them to play in this line. Now, when you place a fire token down onto a tile, you get to activate that tile. So effectively, what this means is there's no way to activate any tile more than once within a round, which means the yellow player now gets three warrior movements. So the yellow player could move over here, and they, if they wanted to, could move into the spot and just go right down into an outpost location. The fact that the blue player is over here does not block that, but they could not go over here and try to go onto this outpost because that would involve fighting, and you have to fight guards first, and again, I'll talk about the details of fighting later on. For the moment, yellow has decided they're just going to avoid this region entirely. Instead, they are going to head up here and make an outpost over there in the forest. Then for their second move, they'll send this warrior over here and leave them as a guard. And for their third move, they're going to take this warrior and move into this region here and go into this forest as an outpost. Now they are going to swap these outposts for the applicable production type. In this forest, that is going to become a hunter. And then in this forest, that is also going to become a hunter. All right, that's finished yellow's three moves. With yellow done, that means we can go, and we must place this pawn down into these two spots, those two spots, or these two, so we actually have six different options we can choose from. For our turn, though, I think we're going to go over here, which means on our third action, we are going to be forced to go over here onto the fire, because that will put our pawns in a line. Now we can perform these actions. We have to start at the top and work down. And the top says that for every forest production area with at least one hunter, we can gain a beaver token. At this point, we haven't moved any of these pieces out of our home territory just yet. And as you can see within each home territory, we all started with a stack of five hunters and five women. And these hunters are on a forest with a beaver. So that means we will gain one beaver token because this is the only forest with at least one of our hunters. And then after we've taken that, we can perform one warrior movement. So let's focus back out here on the map, and I suppose I should have mentioned this before, but the map is specific to the player count. This is the three-player orientation, and you flip some of these boards over for the four-player orientation or for the two-player orientation, and in all of these, every player will have one home territory with other territories in between. Our home territory is over here in the north, and we can now move one of our warriors into an adjacent territory. Now, I think this is a good time to talk about fighting, because we might want to do that. From this territory, we could move over here, and there is a yellow guard there. Now, as I mentioned before, just by entering this region, we don't have to fight. We can simply leave our guard here along with that one. We could also enter this region and simply place an outpost and even swap it into a hunter if we wanted, even though there are these yellow pieces over here. If players want to coexist, they certainly can, or they could fight if they feel like that's in their benefit. Now, the way fighting works is pretty simple. When you move into a region with one of your warriors, you can choose to have them fight an opposing piece. If there are other a player's guards, then you must fight all of their guards first. And when a warrior fights another warrior, each one of them is injured and removed from the board and placed into each player's longhouse on their player boards. So if we fought over here, we would return our warrior to our player board and yellow would return theirs. 
Obviously, if we did that, there would be no yellow warrior over here guarding, and in the future, we could then move one of our warriors into this area. Now, when we do this, we could once again leave it as a guard if we want to, or we could then place it as an outpost onto a spot that already has a hunter or wound token on it. Now, you can only do this if there are no guards of that matching player color, and when you do this, the warrior wins, and that hunter or woman token is injured and removed from the board and placed into that player's longhouse on their player board. After that, this warrior would become an outpost, and then of course you could swap them for the applicable production tile if you wanted to. Now once again, you cannot find a productive area if there are guards of that matching type, which is probably why the yellow player decided to come in here and leave a guard to protect this hunter over here in that forest. So let's now actually perform our move, and we only have one, so that means if we went over here and fought, we'd simply remove these and not really gain anything for our efforts. So I think instead, maybe we should just move into this region over here, and then I think we'll leave this as a guard instead of going into one of the productivity areas. All right, our action is done, which means the blue player can go, and they're going to place a pawn on their board, and they must go here so that they have all of their pawns in a line. Now, as you can see, that shows a mask icon, which means blue can now perform the first mask action of the game. The way this works is they first have to draw a new mask card, and they can either take the top card from the discard pile or the top card from this deck. If you ever take a card from the discard pile and it's the last one in the pile, then you flip over a new card so that there is always a card in the discard. In this case, blue has decided they're going to draw from the top of the deck and they can add that into their hand of mask cards, and every player got one random mask card at the beginning of the game. After that, blue can now take their mask token and place it onto one of the available spots here in the grid. There can't be any other token in that spot, and they've decided they're going to place right over here. Now, in order to place into an area, not only does it have to be empty, but they also have to reveal cards from their hand that match the condition. This condition right here is simply have two different masks, this one right here is have two masks that are the same, and that one right there is three masks that are the same. These over here can let you have sets, so this is two of the same and then two others of the same. And if you want to get one of the hardest ones over here, that is two sets of three identical masks. In this case, blue is going to stay over here, and now they have to play two different masks from their hand face up onto the table. Currently, they only have two cards in their hand, so they can reveal both of these, and as you can see, they are indeed different masks. Now, they place these face up in front of them, and they won't have access to these until the next round of the game, but they will get these back into their hand at that point. So you are going to be building up a larger hand of these masks as you continue throughout the game, taking this action over and over again. So, they've played two different masks which means that condition has been satisfied, and now they are going to gain a number of mask points dictated by the spot they chose. As you can see, we have a mask point icon right here, and this spot only gets them one mask point. If the card they had drawn from the top of the deck matched their first one, they could have gone here and revealed two of the same, and that would have given them two mask points, which is definitely what they were hoping for, but getting one point is still better than nothing. Let's focus out a little bit, and as you can see, the mask track is right over here on the board. At the start of the game, each one of these tokens was randomly placed out next to one of these tracks, and in this game, the mask track is right next to the military track. So the blue player can take one mask point by moving their token once forward on this mask track. Now that might look like they just got one point, but that's not technically the case. Once the game is over, we're going to check each of these pairs of tracks, and the token that is farthest to the left on that track will be the one to score. So effectively, the lower between the mask and military scores for the blue player will be the one that gets them points. So right now, the lower one is military, so they gained one mask point, but technically they haven't gained any victory points at all. In the future, if they're able to gain one or more military points, then at that point they will start to actually getting points, because then this mask point would be their lowest. Now, I will describe how this works again later on in the video when we're talking about what happens once the game is over. Now, the last thing I want to mention about the mask area is that through upgrading, it is possible to perform multiple mask actions within a given round, and if you already have your token out here, you must move it to a new area. You are not allowed to choose the spot that has your token on it already, because technically it's not empty since your token is already there. Well, blue is done, which means the yellow player can now take their turn, and they have decided they are going to perform this action down here. There's a couple icons on it, and they have to go from the top down, and the top part says they're going to count the number of canoes they have out there on the board, and they will gain one fish for each of those canoes. When we look back at the board, yellow has just their starting canoe in a lake, so that means they will gain one fish. 
and then after that they can perform a military action. Now as you can see this has two icons associated with it and the first of these shows a turtle token silhouette so what that means is they will first potentially score turtle tokens before they actually score military. So let's focus over here and as you can see the turtle tokens are organized with canoes, hunters, and women as well as three, four, and five. Now, at this point, a player doing this action can take any of these turtle tiles that they are currently eligible for, and the icons on the back tell you what that eligibility is. Specifically, you can take this one if you have three productivity spots on the board with your women tokens. You can take this one if you have four or more, and that one if you have five or more of those tokens. And the same goes for the hunters and the canoes out there on the board. When we focus on the map, you can see yellow has one canoe, one of the woman productivity spots active, but then three of the hunter productivity spots. So that is going to be enough for them to gain this turtle tile right here. Now it's important to note that there is a number of these tiles in each of these stacks equal to the player count, and players are never allowed to take more than one of the same exact type. So that means in the future, the yellow player cannot take another three hunter tile, but they could take a four hunter tile. It's also worth noting players can gain multiple turtle tiles in this moment, but they have to be from different overall types. So they could gain up to one of the woman type, one of the hunter type, and one of the canoe type all at the same time, as long, of course, as they met the threshold requirements and as long as they did not have that token already. On the back of each of these turtle tiles, there is a type of victory point scoring. That could be economic, ritual, mask, or military, and the player who took this gets to look at it, but they don't reveal it to anybody else, and once the game is over, these will be revealed, and those points will be added to the points that we've gained throughout the game. So, yellow can take this turtle tile, and now perform the military action. The way this works is quite simple. You just look out to the board and count the number of territories where you have more guards than anyone else. If you are tied with an opponent for the same number of guards, then it won't count, and you do get to count your home territories. So as you can see, yellow has the most guards over here in their home territory, which isn't surprising considering you can't actually send these warriors into opposing territories, but they also have the most guards over here in this territory here. So that is one, two territories where they have more of their guards than any opponents, so they will gain two military points. They can mark that on this track by moving their token forward two times. At this point, yellow is done with their turn, so now we can go, and we must place our action pawn right over here on the fire. Now we can place this token down onto any of these six other spots, because obviously we can't put any of our other tokens down since all three of them are out. Now that gives us quite a bit of flexibility in this moment. One thing we could do is the action that the yellow player just did. We did place a new canoe out, so we would get two fish. We would unfortunately not get any turtles, though, because we don't have any of the requirements, but we would gain some military points. And, you know, I think that is going to be worth it, considering we did invest in placing another canoe on the board. So we'll put the campfire token right over here. We will then gain fish equal to the number of canoes that we have out on the board, and that is indeed two. After that, we don't gain any turtles because we don't have at least three canoes on the board, three of the hunter productivity sites, or three of the woman gathering sites on the board. No turtle tile is a bit of a bummer, but I still think this is worth it because we did get those two fish, and we can then score for military, and this is why we decided to leave this warrior over here standing up as a guard. We could have placed them down as a productivity spot, but I thought it was likely that we'd be going for the military sooner rather than later because we invested in another canoe, so now we have the most guards in two regions, so that means we're going to get two military points. That's going to bring us up to two, and that's also finished our action. After that, the blue player can go, and with their last pawn, they must go over here to the turn order track because they've already played three times here on their main board. Blue's turn is done, so yellow can now take the final action of the round, and they must put their token over here so that their tokens are in a line. Now, this is the trade action. Each time a player performs a trade action, they go through three steps in order, and the first step involves that player potentially trading some of their resources for other resources. Now, when I say resources, I specifically mean these wooden tokens, which are fish, leather, as well as beans, corn, and pumpkins. I do not mean the beavers over here. Those do not count as resources. In order to trade, a player simply counts the number of canoes they have out here on the board, and that is the number of trades they can make. They can return one resource to the supply to take any other resource out, and you can mix and match as much as you want. Now, there is potentially a cost here, because if you do at least one trade, then you must do a smallpox check. 
The way this works is you simply draw the top mask card and you look at the bottom of that card. At the bottom, you can see there is a skull or sometimes there is not a skull. And if the card that you draw shows that skull, that means one of your natives has caught smallpox through trading with the white man. If that happens, you simply remove any native token from your board because they are incapacitated and you then place them into the longhouse on your player board. That's right over here, and this is also where you place the natives that become injured through fighting, and there are ways to bring these back out onto the board, and I'll talk about how that works later on. So, the yellow player does have one canoe, which means they could perform up to one trade, but they've decided it's not worth the risk, so they are not going to trade any resources. This means they can move into the second part of trading, where they can optionally purchase up to one progress tile. These are placed up here, and they're sorted in a 1, 2, and 3 point row. And during setup, we randomly chose 2 per player to put out here, which is why we have 6 in each of these rows for a 2 player game. Now, in order to purchase one of these, you have to afford it, and each one of these rows has a specific cost. The first row costs 1 leather as well as 1 fish, and 1 vegetable, which could be a corn, a pumpkin, or beans. The second row costs two leather and two fish, and two different types of vegetables, and the third row costs three leather, three fish, and one of each of the different types of vegetables. At the moment, the yellow player has one leather, two fish, and one bean, so they are going to spend the fish, the leather, and the bean, and that is all they need in order to purchase a level one progress tile. After spending those resources, they can now take any one of these first row tiles. Now, the tile they take is going to stay in front of them for the rest of the game, and every tile gives you a once per round benefit. And since this is the first round of the game, that means they can potentially use whatever tile they take up to seven times. Now, I won't describe the details of all of these, I'll just talk about the ones that are taken, and it looks like they've decided to go simple and take this one here. That can be flipped during their turn in order to gain one leather or one fish. So they've bought this progress tile, and now they can score for it. Every progress tile is going to score economic points equal to the number on that tile. This is a number one tile since it's on the one row, so that means yellow is going to gain one economic point. Then every tile also scores for one other thing in a value equal to that number, and it's going to be different for each tile. This one right here has an arrow with a line, which means they can score one point in a type that they already have the most of. Currently, they have one economic point, zero ritual points, zero mask points, and two military. Military is therefore their highest, which means that this is going to get them one military as well. Sometimes these progress tiles have a static value, like this one right here specifically gives you one economic point and one ritual point. It's worth noting, if you have a tie for the highest or lowest, you could choose between those tied types. Alright, yellow can now take this progress tile and put it in front of them. So the progress tile will go over here, and now they can perform the third step of trading. Remember, the first step uses canoes to potentially trade your resources. The second step involves buying up to one progress tile. And the third step lets you spend resources to get more economic points. Now you can spend up to one resource of each of the five types, and for each resource that you spend, you will gain one economy point. And right now, yellow only has one type of resource, but they can use this at any point during their turn. And these can only be used once per round, and with the round almost over, they figure they may as well use this. So that will get them a fish or leather, and they've decided to go with leather. They can place that right over here, and now as part of the third step, they can get rid of up to one of each different type. So they'll get rid of one leather and one fish, and for each resource they just got rid of, they will gain one economic point. So that means they just purchased two more economy points. This will bring them all the way up to three, which does seem good, but remember you only score the lower of the pair of different types, and right now they have zero ritual points, so it's likely they're going to try to focus on that in the future so that they can get more points from this paired track. Alright, yellow is done with their turn, and all players have taken four turns, which means we can move out of the player turns phase of the round and move into the restore phase. Now there are five different steps to this, and the first one involves adjusting turn order. The way this works is the player on the one spot will take the first player token, so that's going to go to the yellow player. Then the player in the second spot will get the second, so we will get the second player token. And then the third spot will go to blue, and of course if this was a four player game, the fourth player token would go to that player as well. After that, it's now time for each player to cycle their tiles. The first thing that we have to do is remove a campfire token if it's anywhere. We simply put it off to the side. Then what we do is we take all of the tiles that have a player token on it and we flip it over to its ritual side. After that, we can return our player tokens to their designated areas. 
And now each player has to slide all of their action tiles down so that the bottom row actually falls off of the player board. After that, every tile that just fell off gets flipped over so that the ritual side is face down. And now in the new turn order, each player can upgrade up to one of these tiles. Yellow has the first player token, so they get to do this first. The way this works is they can choose any of these and set it to the side in their area in order to take any of these upgraded actions and add that to the other two. As you can see, these upgraded actions are stronger because they have more different actions listed on them. Now, whenever you activate an action, you must start at the top and work your way down. And each one of these has three different options listed on them, or as the starting tiles have one or two. After considering these options, yellow is going to set this tile aside, and they are going to take that one. As you can see, in this case, it's essentially an upgrade. It lets them move up to two times and then harvest beavers from the productivity spots in forests, whereas the other one had them harvest before moving. Also, this upgraded one lets them get fish from their canoes, so overall they think this is just a better option. Now the tile they decided to get rid of will get placed off to the side in their area, and the reason for that is because in the future, when they have a chance to upgrade a tile, instead of taking one from the board, they could swap one of the tiles from their hand with one of the ones placed off to the side. Now generally, that's not something you're going to want to do because obviously these aren't as strong, but if you really need a specific action and it's not currently available over in the upgrade area, then that does give you an option. After that, yellow can take the two remaining tiles and the upgrade. They will then shuffle these together and then place them with the ritual side face down on the board. So let's just hide this a little bit and it looks like this is going to be the order that they go with. Yellow is done, which means the next player in order can do this, and that's going to be us. These are the three tiles that fell off, and before we choose, we do get to replace this spot over here. Now that one just has two options on it, but it's pretty strong, letting you do a trade action as well as a move too. Now up to this point, we haven't done a mask action, and we do have a couple of military points, and masks and military are paired in this game, so part of me wants to take one of these that would give us another mask action. This one over here would let us place more canoes out on the board, and that is tempting considering the action that we used to place a canoe out has been flipped over to its ritual side. Now we could go for this one instead that would use the canoes that we have out there already to gain fish, and it comes with a little bit more movement, and I think that is what we're going to go for. So let's take this, but of course we do have to set aside one of those other three tiles. These are the options, and part of me wants to set this one aside. That lets us get fish from a canoe, and this new action also lets us get fish from a canoe. But if we do that, we will not have any tiles that let us do a military action. Now, it's very possible we'll be able to find a tile with the military action later on, and of course we could swap back with this later on in the game if we really need a military action and we're not seeing any out there. I think that is probably what we're going to do right now. So we can take these tiles and shuffle them up and then place them out. Dang, that is unfortunate. I was hoping this would be over here so that we could do multiple mask actions in the same round, although we don't really have that many masks, so it's not that big of a deal. As you can see, our campfire has been flipped over, so we can't use it to activate something else, but either way, I think I'd prefer to do this action than that one, considering this does one thing and the other one does a lot more. Honestly, this is pretty good, actually, because we have the trade in line, and with the resources that we have already and the extra fish we're going to get from this, it's probably going to make sense to do a trade action. I could change my mind, but I'm already leaning towards placing our tokens here in the middle column. After us, the blue player can now do an upgrade, and these are their options. Ooh, this one also has two options on it, a three move as well as the military action. After considering these, they honestly really like the look of this. They currently have their move 3 in hand, so they don't mind getting rid of that one to swap it for this, so that they can move 3 and then immediately score for military after that, as well as potentially get turtles for the productivity spots they just moved into. After that, we can reveal another one from the top of the stack, and it's worth noting that once we finish 3 rounds of the game, all of these will be wiped, and then we will bring in these purple upgrades, which are even stronger, and you use these for the last 4 rounds of the game. So, blue can shuffle these up and place them on their board. And now we can restore masks. This is simple. All players just take any face-up masks in front of them, and they add them back into their hand. It looks like blue is the only player to perform a mask action so far. After that, all players can refresh any progress tiles they have. So far, that's just the yellow player over here, so they can refresh this by flipping it face-up, which means they could then use this again in the next round. 
After that, the final thing we do is move the year marker to the next year. Now this means we finished the first round, which is also a year, and we're going to play over seven years. And as I said before, when we go from the third year to the fourth year, that is when we bring out these purple upgrades into the upgrade market. All right, we can now start the player turns phase of the second round of the game, and the yellow player gets to go first. After considering their options, they want to go right here and perform the first ritual action of the game. On the back side of every one of these tiles, there is the ritual action icon, and you can obviously not perform this in the first round because you only see these once you flip over a tile after activating it in the previous round. Now there's two steps to each ritual action, and the first involves the player being able to take up to two natives from their longhouse, and they can place those into their home territory, and you can choose any mixture of the natives that are in your longhouse. After thinking it through, they're going to place one hunter and one of their warriors down into their home territory. They can place those into the applicable regions. Remember, you can only have multiple of the hunters or the woman tokens when you place them on productivity spots within your home territory. After that, the second step of the ritual has the player scoring ritual points equal to the number of natives they have of their least common type within their home territory. In this case, we can see they have four hunters. They also have five of the woman tokens, and they have five of the warriors. So the smaller type is going to be hunters, and they will get one ritual point for each. So that means they will gain four ritual points now. As you can see, ritual points are paired up with the economy in this game, so they will take the four, and by doing that, they've effectively gained three victory points, because again, you only get points for the lower of the paired track, and they already had three economy points. So they've cashed those points in, they're definitely going to get these three right over here, and they will probably try to keep these going up in a pair to get as many points as they can as the game goes on. Well, yellow is done, which means it's our turn, and we could reserve the first player spot for the next round. And honestly, I think that's fine. The plans that we might have for this round are not super time sensitive, so I think let's go over here, which means technically we are getting a little bit behind our opponents in this round, but it means we'll have first pick for various things in the next round, and I think that'll be slightly better for us. After that, blue can go, and they want to go over here on their upgraded tile. This gives them three warrior movement, and then they can perform a military action. So they can focus out on the board, and for their first movement, they'll head over here and leave that as a guard. Then for the second one, they will head over here and go into this forest productivity spot. And with the third movement, they're going to head over here and go into that forest productivity spot. Then they're going to swap both of these outposts out for the applicable type. So that means they're going to put two of these hunters down. And then they can perform the military action. And of course, the first thing they do is check to see if they gain any turtle tiles. When we focus back on the board, we can see they do have three regions with at least one woman tile. So they will take this, and they also have three regions with at least one of the hunter tile, so they can take that as well. Now remember, you can't take multiple of the same type, so in the future they won't be able to take either of these. But they figure for one action, taking both of these is great, and they'll probably try to build up on that if possible. Now after that, they can score for military, which effectively means they get one military point for every region where they have more guards than anyone else. And right now they have more here, more here, and more there. So that is going to be three military points, which is going to bring them up to three total. All right, that's finished a pretty strong turn for the blue player. With blue done, the yellow player can go now. And they've decided to simply reserve turn order so that they will go second in the next round. They'll place their token right over here. And now it's time for us to go. Now I think the first thing that we should do is probably a ritual to get as many points as we can before we do this action later on, which will probably have us moving some of our natives out of our home territory. The first part of the ritual lets us take up to two of these natives from the longhouse and place them into the home territory. And honestly, I think we're just going to put both of our warriors down. After we do that, we can score for the lowest type of native we have in the home territory. We haven't actually moved any of our hunters or our women tokens out just yet. So we have five, five, and six. So five is the lowest amount, which means we're still going to score five ritual points, which seems pretty good to me. So we'll go up five spots on this track, and we definitely want to get a bunch of points for the economy track. And I think we have a pretty decent plan to work towards that. Considering we're likely going to do both of these actions, one of them's going to get us more resources, and that one should let us buy a progress tile. I'm hoping to actually grab a second level progress tile, but we'll just have to see if we can pull that off later on in the round. Alright, blue is next, and just like the last round, they're going to be the last person to put a token over here, so they figure there's no reason to not do that for their last action. So instead, they're going to activate one of these, and they'll go for the middle. That will let them gain a beaver for each of their forest hunter productivity spots, and they can then move once. 
They currently have three of those spots, so they can take three beavers. They already had two, so they have quite a lot of these. And when they end up turning all of these into leather, they will have quite a bit of that as well. I suppose I haven't actually talked about that just yet. It's quite simple. As you can see, this action lets you turn all of your beaver tokens in, and then you take an equal amount of the leather resource from the supply. So it makes sense to get a bunch of beavers before doing this, which is probably why no one's actually performed this action just yet in the game. Next up, Blue can perform one movement. And it looks like they're going to move a warrior over here and leave them as a guard. So they have one guard in each of the regions that currently also have their productivity sites. After that, Yellow can take their turn and they are going to go up here. That will give them two movement before they can then gather beavers for their hunter spots. And then they can also gather fish equal to the number of canoes they have on the board. For the movement, they're going to take this warrior and send them over here to this uh, pumpkin patch productivity spot. And with the other move, they're going to head over here and go into this beans spot. And they are going to swap both of those out for woman tokens. And then they'll gain beavers equal to the number of forest productivity spots. They have at least one hunter, and that is three of them. So just like the blue player, they have five beavers total. Finally, they're going to gain one fish for every canoe they have, and that's still just one. They would definitely like to get more canoes out, but for now, they're still okay with that, so they'll gain one fish. Yellow is done, which means we can go, and I think we are definitely going to go for this middle column. Now, let's go here first. That action gives us three different things. The first thing lets us gain a fish equal to the number of canoes we have on the board, and we currently have two, so we can take two fish from the supply. And then after that, we can perform a mask action. Now, I just realized that during the restore phase at the end of the round, when you reset masks, you also need to reset these mask tokens. So that should have been over there. Now, what we can do is draw this card or the top card from the deck. And this is the first card that we have. Now, this doesn't match that. So I think let's just go random and hope that it's going to match. And it doesn't. That's unfortunate, but we can still put our mask token right over here onto the two different mask spot and then play both of these face up in front of us. So that's going to get us one mask point, which we can track right up here. Lastly, we get two warrior movement. And we do have quite a few warriors. Now, the yellow player is somewhat overextending. If we wanted to, we could move this warrior right over here and then put it right into one of these spots to kick out one of these natives and place it into the yellow player's longhouse. Now, we'd probably only do that if we didn't have good spots for ourselves and if we thought the yellow player was winning. Right now, I'm honestly a little bit more concerned about the amount of territory the blue player has taken here on the map. You know what? I think I do want to curtail Blue's expansion. They got quite a few military points for that, and then they have just a bunch of harvesting happening out here, and we don't want that to continue for too long. So I think let's spend our first movement and go over here and simply fight this guard. That does mean that both of these go back to longhouses, but we've just brought more guards out, so that means we still have more on the map than the Blue player does. Now we have one more movement available to us, and I think let's head over here and kick out this Blue hunter right there. That will become injured and we'll head back to the blue player's longhouse. And then I think we should swap that out for one of ours. Now we are somewhat undefended over here, but we can tell the blue player does not have access to more movement in this round based off of how they've placed their tokens. And we know that we're going to take our turn before blue does in the next round, which means we should be able to reinforce this if we want to before the blue player is able to come back in. We are done, so blue can go, and they must perform this action to keep their tokens in a line. That is a trade action, and they currently have one canoe, so the first thing they could do is take any one of their resources and turn it into another one, but only once because of that one canoe. If they did that, though, they would have to check to see if any native caught smallpox, and they've decided it's not worth the risk. They think they have the resources that they need. So they're now going to buy a progress tile, and they're going to take a level 1 progress tile, which costs a leather, a fish, as well as one of the vegetable types, and they've got a bunch of pumpkins, so they figure they'll spend one of those. So they can take one of these five tiles, and they've decided to go for this one right here. Now that says that when they perform ritual actions, they will gain one more ritual point, and they will gain one movement alongside that action. This will, of course, get them economy points. In this case, that is going to be one. And then this also shows the ritual token and the one, so they will gain one ritual token alongside. Now they can place this in front of them, and of course they do have to flip this over when they utilize this action, so they'll only gain this benefit for up to one of the ritual actions within each round. Finally, they can spend up to one of each of the five resources, and for every one they spend, they will gain an economy point. And they've decided to spend this pumpkin and this corn. That's two different resources, so that will get them two more economy points. 
Blue is done, so yellow can go. And for their last action of the round, they are forced to go here, and that will get them vegetables based off of their woman productivity spots on the board. When we glance out, we can see that's going to be two beans and one pumpkin. After that, we can go, and I think it's time for us to do a trade action. Now, we have two canoes on the board, which means we can trade up to two of our resources for any other type of resource. And I think we do want to do this. Specifically, let's spend one fish and turn that into a hide. And then with the other canoe, let's spend this fish and turn it into not corn. We want to get one of those second level progress tiles, and we need different types of vegetables. So I figure we will trade that for a pumpkin. Now, the fact that we did any trades means we do have to do a smallpox check. And again, the way this works is we discard the top mask card from the deck, and if it has a skull on the bottom, then we do actually have one of our natives come down with smallpox. The card does show a skull, so that's certainly unfortunate. So this means we have to choose any one of our natives on the board, and they become ill, and they go back to our longhouse. Now we can select any native, which again is going to be warriors, hunters, or women. And right now we've got quite a few beavers. I think we can go ahead and have this hunter right here catch smallpox and go back to our longhouse. After that, it's now time to buy a progress tile. We're going to take a second level, which means we have to spend two leather as well as two fish and two different types of vegetables so we can spend this pumpkin and this corn. With that in mind, let's focus out here on our options. Now, obviously, each one of the level two progress tiles will get us two economy points and two of something else. It could be the thing that we have the most in, the thing that we have the least in, or various other things. Now, for now, I think I'm going to focus on the effects of these progress tiles, but obviously, as you get later on in the game and you start to know which of the types of scorings you are weak in, that might more dictate which of these progress tiles you end up investing in. So let's briefly look at all of these level two options. This one is simple. We could flip it once per round to get a leather or a fish, as well as one vegetable. This one says we could flip this over when we are buying a progress tile to have a reduction of two resources. So that would be good for getting some of the even more expensive and powerful progress tiles. A discount is certainly something to consider. After that, this says that once per round you can flip this over in order to lower one of your tokens on a track and then increase another token on the track. So you can use this to better balance out your tracks in order to get more points once the game is over. After that, this one can be flipped over when you do a mask action, and it says that before you actually perform that action, you can pull all of your mask cards that you've already played back into your hand to then use for that mask action. So this would be really powerful if we can see ourselves performing multiple mask actions within the same round. This one over here says that whenever you turn an outpost into a productivity spot with a hunter or a woman token, instead of returning that one warrior back to your home area, you can instead stand it up as a guard in the area where that productivity site was. Lastly, this one is simple. You can flip it over to gain two movement, and again, you can use this at any point during your turn, and having movement before doing lots of other actions can be a really flexible and beneficial thing. Up to this point, we've really not moved much on the board, so I think we should probably take this one. I was really tempted by this discount, I have to say, but for now, I think this is a good call, especially considering the round is coming to an end, so we don't have an opportunity to use this one, but we could use it in the future, whereas we could use this one immediately to get two more movement, and I think that'll be good. Now, before we go there, we will gain two economy points as well as two military points. These are the first two economy points of the game for us. And then our military will jump up to four. So we do have a decent amount of points we want to get from masks. And we can continue to keep that in mind as we take our turns. And then we can place this in front of us. And I see no reason not to use it immediately. So that is going to get us two warrior movement. And I think we'll keep it simple and just move this warrior over here and leave them as a guard. And then move that one over there and leave them as a guard as well. We are going to gain access to that progress tile again in the next round. And we can maybe move out even more from there. At this point, the final part of the trade action lets us discard up to one of each resource type to gain an economy point for those. And we just have a fish, so I figure we may as well spend that because that is one type, so that will get us one more economy point. All right, we are done with our turn, which means blue can go, and they have not yet gone to the turn order spot, so they must go there. And in fact, once we do that, we can see that everyone has taken their four actions. This means the player turn phase is over, and it's now time to restore for the next round. The first thing that we do is adjust for turn order. So we are going to be the first player, yellow will be second, and then blue will be third, and then of course we can take these tokens back. After that, we have to cycle our action tiles, which again means we flip over any that have a token, which means any with a ritual side do get flipped over back to their regular side. 
After that, we can push all of these down so that the bottom three fall out. And then we can flip over any that show a ritual side. Now we can go in turn order, upgrading tiles, and we are the start player, so we can discard one of these and take a new one from the board. Of these three options, I think this is probably the weakest. Movement is great, and the flexibility of the campfire is also great, but I do still want to be able to harvest, so I think what we should do is get rid of this one, and then we should pull in, well, this one or that one. This is pretty good considering it would let us score military and we have quite a few of our warriors out there on the map already. Whereas this one is good because it will give us another opportunity to perform mask actions to get more of those cards in our hand. You know, I think let's go for that. We already have a decent military score. Let's take this one right here so that we can harvest and do mask actions together. After that, we can reveal a new tile and then randomly place these onto the top row of our board. Next up, yellow can choose, and they've decided to give this up to take that one. That lets them do a mask action as well as a movement and start getting canoes down. They haven't placed any down so far, and they would like to make that happen. After that, we can see the next upgrade tile. And then they can place these randomly on the top of their board. And finally, blue can take one of these, and they're going to get rid of this, put a canoe down, and take that one. It not only lets them get fish, but it lets them do a military action and put a canoe down. Of course, you don't have to align these like that, but it's generally good to not try and be weak on something, especially at this point in the game. Now we can flip a new one over, and then randomly place these down onto the blue player's board. It's now time to restore masks, so we can put these tokens back, and everyone can take the mask cards back into their hands. Each player can then refresh progress tiles, although it looks like I forgot to have yellow use this in the last round. I'm sure they would have, and considering they have a ton of beavers, I think they would have used this to gain a fish, and they will probably look to try and turn these into leather soon, and then this will flip back over again. Finally, we could advance the year token, and then move into the third year of the game. It looks like we are going to be the first player, and I think for our very first action, let's actually go here. As you can see, the first thing this lets us do is turn all of our beavers over here into leather. So we'll gain three leather from doing that, and then after that we can move once on the board. With this movement, I think let's send this warrior over here, and then we can lay it down, turn it into an outpost, and then place one of our women onto that spot so that we can harvest these beans later on in the game. Now at the moment we could use this progress tile to get two more movement, but I think let's wait until our next action to see if we have to react to anything that our opponents end up doing. Our turn is done, so that means yellow gets to go. And they've decided to start by going onto their campfire, and they're going to place their campfire token on this. Now that is an upgraded tile that they put down, and remember you don't flip over the tiles that you activate with your campfire. So by doing this, that means that will be there on the next round of the game, and they could potentially use it essentially two rounds in a row. Now, the first thing they will do is place a canoe out onto the board, which will go right over here, and then they can perform a mask action. This means they can draw the top discard or the top one from the deck, and they're going to go with the deck. And then they are going to reveal two cards from their hand, and it looks like they are the same. The one they drew from the top of the deck matched their first one, so that means they can place their token over here because those are matching cards, and that's going to get them two mask points. Finally, this action will give them one movement, and considering they have a couple of production sites over here and no guards, they think it's probably going to be good for them to head over there with this as a guard to offer a little bit of protection. This means the blue player can go, and they are going to start with their first ritual action of the game. This means they can place up to two of their natives from the longhouse back into their home territory. And they've decided to go with two warriors. After that, they will score ritual points for the type of native they have the least of in their home territory. They have three of the hunters and three of the women, so that means three is the minimum, so they are going to gain three ritual points. They were at one, so that brings them to four, and then they're going to use this progress tile. That says that when they perform a ritual, they can flip this over to gain one more ritual point, which brings them up to five, and then this also says they can perform one movement. After considering their options, they've decided to spread themselves a little thin. They're going to head over here and then lay down as an outpost, and then they're going to place one of their woman tokens on that bean field spot. Now, they are pretty undefended. They don't have any guards here or there, but looking around, they feel like this is probably going to be okay. They don't think the yellow player is going to have that many more movement, so they're hoping that they can get away with this to try and harvest more later on in the round. Well, blue is done, which means we can go again, and I think we're going to want to activate this column here. 
By doing that, we can use this campfire to activate that, which seems like a good action to go for, especially to place this down and not flip it over so that we can then perform it again. Now with that in mind, I think we should do a ritual action sooner rather than later before we potentially use this to move some of our natives out. Well, the first thing to do is place two natives from our longhouse into our home territory. I think let's go with one warrior as well as one of our hunters. Once we've added those down, we can check for the lowest type we have, and it looks like we actually have four of each type. So we can score four ritual points, which will bring us from five all the way up to nine. So we have a lot more than we need, honestly, which isn't too surprising, considering we have very few natives in our longhouse. So we should probably try to focus on other things. As you might have noticed, those action boards can be filled up with quite a few ritual actions. And what that realistically means is the higher up you activate tiles, the longer those tiles are going to stay ritual actions. So if you keep activating things along the top, you're probably going to find yourself in a situation where you're forced to take many more ritual actions than you like, giving you a ton of ritual points, which likely won't give you points at the end of the game if you can't match those points with the other matching track. Well, we're now done with our turn, so yellow can go. And they have decided to do a ritual. Maybe they should have done this before their first turn where they moved a warrior out, but either way, this is what's happening now. So they can bring up to two of their natives out, and they have even less natives in their longhouse than we do. After considering their options, they're going to bring out a woman as well as one of these warriors. And then the minimum amount of a type they have in here is going to be four. So that is going to give yellow four more ritual points, bringing them up to eight. Now, I do want to say that at this point in the game, I feel like yellow, as well as us, to a slightly lesser extent, are probably not expanding out as much as we should be. We've got all of these natives here in our home territories, giving us way more ritual points than we realistically need. And if we were able to move them out onto the board, we'd be able to gain even more benefits for them. So I think we're maybe playing a little bit too cautious. And, you know, this is the first time I'm actually playing through the game. And I can certainly see there are advantages to expanding out significantly, especially if you find yourself in situations where you kind of have to take ritual actions to bring those natives back, well, then it's not the worst thing in the world to have some natives removed if you overextend and your opponents fight you back. At this point, yellow is done, and blue has decided for the first time in the game they would like to be the start player, so they will be the first player in the next round. After that, it's our turn again, and I figure we may as well reserve the second place spot and then perform this action the next time it comes around to us. After that, yellow can go, and they obviously have to choose this action right here. Now that is going to turn all of their beavers into leather, and they have five beavers. So that gets them five leather, and they are definitely good on leather for a little while. You can certainly spend quite a bit of this by buying those higher cost progress tiles. The third level costs three leather and three fish, so it's probable that's what they are starting to work towards. But they don't even have a trading action face up on their board, so that's something they would have to perform later on in the game. And obviously working up towards that is certainly not a bad thing. Speaking of resources, they are going to use this progress tile to get themselves a fish, so that means they do indeed have the three fish and three hides that they need in order to get a level three tile. However, those also require one of each of the different vegetable types, and at the moment, they don't have any corn. Fortunately, you can trade for that. Yellow is done, so blue can go, and they're going to go over here. It looks like this is the round to cash in beavers for those leather. Blue has five beavers, so they are also going to get five leather. And then after that, they can move once. After considering their options, they're going to send this warrior over here and leave them as a guard for that region. All right, it's our turn again, but before we actually take it, I would like to mention this swap tile. Each of us has one of these, and if we want to, we can discard this at any point in order to move the location of any two tiles on our grid. If we have this at the end of the game, it will be worth one guaranteed point to us, though, so we only want to spend this if we have to. Right now, I don't think we need to though. Let's go here and activate the fire and then put this fire token right over there. This means we are going to harvest in our vegetable fields and then we can do a mask action. And of course, since we have a fire token, we will not flip that tile and then we could then perform this again in the next round of the game. Now, before we harvest, let's use our progress tile. That is going to give us two movement. And right now we can see that we are getting one corn and one beans. So I figure we may as well use this movement in order to get a couple more vegetables. Having a variety of vegetables is certainly good when it comes to getting those progress tiles, but in order to get that, we do have to extend. Uh, we could move this warrior over there and get a pumpkin patch going in this spot, but it's very close to blue, and I'm not sure how long that would actually stay there. It might make more sense to leave this warrior over there protecting that area and then move it into some other spots to get more resources that we already have. We have a couple of canoes, so trading isn't that big of a deal to get the resources that we need. And at this point, I feel like playing it a little safe. 
So let's go ahead and move this here as an outpost and that one there as an outpost. And then we can turn each of these into a production field. Both of these are guarded by a single guard, which is better than nothing, which we'd have over there. Although, of course, that would get us a pumpkin. Then again, that plan would also leave only one guard over there. So overall, I think this is probably a better plan for us. Now, after we've used that progress tile for the movement, we can we can harvest these vegetables. In this case, it looks like we are going to get one, two, three corn, as well as one beans. After that, we can now perform a mask action. At the moment, we have these two cards, which are different, and we can see that the discard matches it. So we could take that to have a pair, and then, oh, no, we actually couldn't play a pair because the yellow player already went onto that spot. So I suppose we would have to play two different, which we already have, which would only get us one mask point. So I don't think drawing this card makes sense. Instead, let's go random, and, oh, nice, we got a different type. Now what we can do is play all three of these as different types. And that will let us put our token over here on the three different type spot. And that will get us two mask points, which is certainly better than getting one mask point. Although this does mean we have to play three cards from our hand instead of two. Now that would only matter to us if we were planning on performing multiple mask actions within the same round. And while we technically could have done that this round, I felt it made sense to diversify a little bit. So we're going to play all of these three out and then gain two mask points. Our turn is done, which means yellow can go, and for their final action, they're simply going to go over here to the player order track. After that, blue can now take their last action of the round. Now, they don't have a choice in the matter. They must place their action here on the fire, although they now have a choice. They can place this down onto any of these six options, and they've decided to go over here. This means they will first gain fish equal to the number of canoes they have out on the board. Then they will do a military action, and then they can place another canoe. At the moment, we can see they have four canoes in their area, which means they only have one on the board. So that is going to get them a single fish. Then they can perform this military action, and before that, they can check to see if they gain any more turtle tiles. Blue currently has the three hunter and three woman turtle tile. And when we look out here, they currently have actually four different production spots with the woman on it. So that means they are eligible to take this turtle tile and they can add that to the rest that they have. But they don't have enough to take a new hunter tile or a canoe tile. After this, they can score for military. It looks like they have the most guards in one, two, three areas, which is probably another reason why they just put this guard over there on their previous turn. So that is going to get them three military points which means they're up to six, and they only have one mask point. So maybe they should stop prioritizing military as much and switch gears into masks. That's definitely something they should probably do in the next few rounds. The final thing this action lets them do is place a new canoe out onto the board, which is honestly one of the main reasons they decided to do this. Getting those military points seemed like a decent side effect, but mostly they wanted fish and they wanted to place a canoe down. So they're going to place this right out here, and they now have two on the board. All right, that's finished everyone's actions, so now it's time for the restore phase. We can start by adjusting turn order. Blue is going to be first, then we will be second, and yellow will be third. And then we can cycle our action tiles. After that, blue can upgrade. And they've decided to get rid of this tile and replace it with that one, which lets them do a vegetable harvest as well as move a couple times. Next up, we can go, and the thing that we are lacking in the most is economy. So I think we should probably keep this, and having masks is good as well. So I think we are going to get rid of this tile and replace it with one of these, and it looks like both of these would get us another opportunity in order to trade, as well as that one over there, actually. Now, having a bunch of these is nice, but we would also have to have the resources to back it up, although there are those cheaper progress tiles, several of them anyway, that have not been picked up so far. So I think maybe it makes sense to take this one so that we can have another opportunity to turn beavers into leather. Maybe we could get rid of our other beaver into leather action in the future. Having an extra move is also not a bad thing. So we're going to take this and add it onto our board, randomizing it with the other ones. Finally, the yellow player gets to upgrade. These are the tiles they have to choose from, and while they'd like to get rid of this one, it's currently the only way for them to add new canoes, and they would like to add some more out, so they're actually going to get rid of this one and replace it with that, which is effectively the same action, except it also comes with two movement, which is definitely a good thing, considering they have a ton of natives in their home territory. After that, it's now time to refresh masks, so we can move these tokens over, and then take all of the face-up mask cards that we have in front of us and put them into our hands. After that, we can refresh all of the progress tiles that we have in front of us. And finally, we can move forward with the year track. And as you can see, going from 3 to 4 also crosses this icon. 
and that means it's now time to bring out these purple upgrades. So we can discard all of the brown ones because we won't use any of these for the rest of the game. Then these can be shuffled and then we'll deal out a market of six of these onto the table. As you can see, these are stronger in general. You've got things like four movement and place two canoes out onto the board. So some of these are very strong effects. Well, at this point, we would now be ready for the fourth round of the game, but I think now is a good time to stop actually playing through and instead discuss what happens once the game is over. Now, again, the game always lasts seven rounds, so once we have fully completed seven rounds of the game, the game will be over and it will then be time for final scoring. The first thing we do in final scoring is every player is going to reveal all of the turtle tiles that they've picked up throughout the game, and then they will gain the associated track benefits that show. For example, at this point after three rounds, the blue player has two military track bumps and one ritual track bump, but these are face down, so only they know this, and of course they can keep this in mind as they're making decisions. It's worth noting all of the five level turtle tiles give you two different track options to choose from, and you get to go up twice with those. You'll notice the fours also let you go up twice but that's just on one specific type now once everyone has revealed all of their turtle tiles and taken those points it will then be time to calculate our scores as i've mentioned before for each of these pairs of tracks every player is going to find the score that is lower and that will be the amount of points you get for that pair so for example over here the blue player has six military but only one mask so right now they're just getting one point whereas we have four military and three masks so we're getting three points from this up here now, once you take the points from one track, you add that to the points from the other, and you, of course, once again, take the one that's lowest. And then after adding those points together, you also gain a victory point if you have not used your swap tile throughout the game. Once we add all of that up, the player with the most points will be the winner. Now, at this point, I do believe I've taught just about all of the rules to the game, which means this tutorial is coming to a close. I hope that you enjoyed learning how to play Wendake, and please, if any part of this game jumps out to you, or if there's a turn where you feel like we should have done something differently, then please comment down below, because I love to see that kind of feedback. As always, I'd like to thank everyone who's been supporting this channel, including these producer-level Patreon supporters. If you too would like to directly support the channel in the creation of future videos like this one, then please go to jongetsgames.com support. Also, if you enjoyed this video, please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. Thanks for watching.